Good evening. As the Senior Director of Alumni Relations, it is my distinct privilege and pleasure to welcome you back to campus tonight, or for those of you that have been here all day, to, that you're still here, welcome, to hear one of our faculty members who will expand upon her latest findings in the realm of spirituality. Teachers College has long been a hotbed for new and developing fields, so we find it completely fitting that Professor Miller's work continues to evolve and shape this field especially as we are in the midst of our own strategic innovation and working to keep Teachers College the place where the future comes first. We're so happy that you're here tonight as we celebrate the launch of Professor Lisa Miller's latest book, The Spiritual Child, The New Science on Parenting for Health and Lifelong Thriving. Lisa Miller is Professor of Psychology and Education, the Director of TC's Clinical Psychology Program, and director of the newly founded Spirituality Mind Body Institute. Upon joining the faculty here at Teachers College, Professor Miller immediately began to make a name not only for herself, but also for the college and our place in this burgeoning new field of spirituality and mindfulness. She has been featured in many news outlets from the New York Times and even a recent appearance on the Today Show. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Professor Lisa Miller. That was so sweet. Thank you for that kind introduction. Hi. Thank you for coming. I'm excited to see you, and I hope this is a meaningful moment for every single person in the room. This book, like all children, was raised by a village. My beautiful team from St. Martin's Press is here who edited every single word of this book, who saw this book through from vision to proposal, and now in its beautiful form through marketing and distribution. It's beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. My beloved TC, we've been together. You're the only job I've ever had, my one true love. <laughs> and it's been a wonderful place to grow together, like a good marriage. This has been a place of total intellectual freedom. It would be hard to imagine how this could have lived without the rich intellectual freedom, the support for new ideas, the commitment to rigor founded on integrity. TC has been an ideal space for the growth of the work in our lab, the growth of the field, and becoming now together an epicenter for supporting spirituality in the course of development. So welcome. When I first started out in about 1996, I was sitting in a clinic in Washington Heights and a little girl came in. And it's very, very rare that a child comes alone to treatment. Usually a child comes unwillingly with a parent by her or his side. But this little girl had brought herself. And when she came into my office, I said, well, tell me your story. And she said, well, her story was as tragic and awful as could be. Her father ran a corner deli. One night, two men had come in who he knew killed him. And with his death, she lost everything she loved and cared about. The father had held her world. She went elsewhere to live and became very walled up and sequestered by extended family who didn't allow her to see other children, who didn't allow her to see boys, who didn't allow her to have the developmentally normative phases of early adolescence. And so her recovery was slow, and we went from probably a two to a three, and in time a five, and then at six, loitered for months upon months, until one day she said, you know, there's really, in her young voice, there's no change. I'm locked in my room. There's little I can do. And her quest to understand boys had been to go into the teeny magazines, teeny bot magazines, and cut out pictures of boys and make a mural, which she would bring to treatment. She'd say, he seems nice, and he seems like he would be polite. And you know, this was her chance of getting to know the sort of early phases of boy meets girl. Until one day, she came galloping into my <laughs> office changed, no longer a six. And you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. And I said, well, what, what could it be? She's like, well, my, my, uh, my cousin's uncle, he was chaperoned me so I could go to the party. And there I met a boy. And I talked to a boy. And he was so nice. And he was so polite. And we talked and laughed. And here's the part. You'll never believe this. Guess what his name is? And I said, well, what's his name? And she said, well, his name is Elvis. Don't you see? And I said, well, no. She said, well, that was my father's name. My father sent him. And when she saw 
her dream come true, which was actually talking to a boy, and recognized it as being filled with her father's protection and guidance still, and recognized it as outside the realm of pedestrian unfolding, but as a sacred event. My father sent him. She shifted from six permanently. And we had another platform on which to work because she and her father and the sacred presence were all one in her life again. Her father was with her. Her father was watching over her. And it was with a sense of a sacred, loving, protecting universe that her father was walking over her. Things shifted for her. And that deep interweaving of the love of a parent and the love of the ultimate presence is what time and time again I've seen clinically, I've seen in teaching, I've seen in the numbers and the data is the most powerful source of protection against suffering, the most powerful wellspring of thriving in children, the interwoven effect of parental love and sacred love, which in the spiritual child, we explore as the field of love. The notion of a field takes us beyond the caller-to-caller -caller telephone line of parental bonding that was prevalent in the 20th century and says that as much as it's great to be connected and bonded with your mother, there are other people who are just as important, like your father, like your grandmother, like your beloved babysitter, like your sibling or your uncle's aunt, whoever it is that loves you, can play the role that, shall we call her, Ariella's father played for her. And that has been the bedrock of the spiritual child, the unifying of parental love, of ambassador love, whether it's grandma, grandpa, and uncle, father, cousin, and sacred love. This book is based on science, and it's based on 15 years of science from our lab, so it's particularly thrilling to see many of the doctoral students who've contributed over the years. Can you wave your hands? Right? <laughs> And it's based on science from our colleagues or across the country as well. The reason I wrote The Spiritual Child was that having seen such a strong signal, a glaringly bright light of the power of spirituality and family to shape a child, it absolutely kept me up at night that our culture didn't have it. I mean, it literally depressed me. It drove me nuts. I couldn't stand it every day at pick up and drop off, every day in deep discussions with fellow parents about our children, this information wasn't accessible. It wasn't in the parent culture. And so this divide was unlivable. And I went to a very, very good book agent who took me to a very, very good editor. And we figured out how to bring this to parents. Editor. <laughs> okay. Let me walk you through the science and start with a statement of where we are now. Where we are in our culture is that people comfortably talk about character. We couldn't speak more about grit, about determination, about forgiveness, right? This is something which most people comfortably discuss at the dinner table, talk about in school, right? But it turns out that if you look at the greatest and most prevalently discussed character strengths, resilience, optimism, forgiveness, they really appear not to be ends in themselves or deep reservoirs in themselves, but really more understood as the beautiful flower on a deep tree of meaning and life orientation. So a child most likely does not have persistence for the sake of persistence or optimism out of a hat. It comes from somewhere. And what children will often say is, I stick with it because I believe I have a contribution to make. I stick with this because I believe that I am serving God with the gifts given to me. I stick with this because I am the first in my family to go to college. There's a much deeper reason why I stick with this than for the sake of sticking with it. And time and time again, we find that actually the most common reason for sticking with it is a sense of being part of a spiritual world. Jakob, <laughs> the first author on this paper from our lab, shows that this top blue line shows the highly, highly <coughs> spiritual child is the very same child who's loaded up with all those nice character traits 
the very same child high in grit, blue child, who's the very same child high in gratitude and life optimism, who's the very same child who has a strong sense of living in a sacred universe. The child who says, I believe that people come into my life for a reason. When I talk to God, I hear an answer. The child who's in dialogue with a sacred world is the very same child who has all those lovely strengths that both yield lives of meaning and purpose and, can I trouble someone for help here, um, and actually are associated with outward success as well which debunks the myth that somehow a child is a functioning machine or a soulful, solitary monk on a mountain. The very same child who's deep into a soulful life is the very same child who is functionally thriving. Now, the lines under that, for the most part, run in parallel. And we love all children equally here at TC. So the child who's medium on spirituality is medium on grit and optimism and all else. And this child down here, the red child, who's low on a personal experience of spirituality, is low on grit and optimism. And we care just as much about the red child as we do about the blue child. So how do we help them? And how do we help them not only now, when it's a half fait accompli, but proactively? How do we form a developmental model in parenting and education that supports natural spirituality as a source of character strengths and inner meaning and value and purpose. Okay? There is an exception, and humanity is magnificent, as is all nature, for our biodiversity. There's always 10 or 15 percent that get to yes another way, right? Whether it's through hair and eye color, whether it's through sexual orientation, biodiversity is the bedrock of who we are, right? And the biodiversity here is that there's one group. Thank you. I trouble. Thank you, Yaka. My wingman. Will you stay? Since we're yeah, And your wife can stand next to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this right here is a group of people who are, like all else, consistent across positive psychology strengths. The same, you know, high in grit, high in optimism. But they are the exception to the rule. They are the virtuous humanists, and they're about 15% of the late adolescence. Right? So if you have a child, the goal of a parent is to understand what is the bedrock, what is the tree upon which the blossoms grow for my child. Are they a virtuous humanist? Four out of five times, their bedrock is a spiritual reality. <laughs> Science tells us when we look across levels of analysis, whether we're looking at twin studies to look at the hair level contribution, MRI studies, whatever level of analysis we may be looking at, some notions about natural spirituality. And the first big point that is so important to change our view of who children are and who we are is that every child is born a spiritual child. Every one of us is born with an innate spiritual capacity, which is our natural spirituality. This surges and burgeons with puberty in the second decade. And if it is supported, is the greatest source of thriving and the greatest source of protection against the most prevalent forms of suffering in the second decade. Now, one third is heritable. That means that when you look at us as adults, two thirds, <laughs> two thirds is not heritable. <laughs> it has to do with our path in life and how we engage the world around us. And it has to do with the spiritual guides and teachers and parents and mentors. Right? And when is this most crucial in our formation? It is most crucial with puberty and adolescence. Because it's in puberty that the spiritual innate capacity opens, surging. For room, a window of awakening as understood through the world traditions and as understood through genetic epidemiology, the surge is a biological window of emergence. What do we know about teens? Hungry for meaning, hungry for purpose, hungry with the head, but also hungry in the heart, to the point where it is frustrating and intolerable to not feel connection and oneness. It is empty and the ennui cuts like a knife to not feel the deep connection and love and oneness. So the hunger of the heart and the hunger of the head surge in adolescence for every adolescent. Most cultures have met them where they are. And with puberty are rites that integrate spirituality and the teen is a spiritual knower. Whether it's bar and bar mitzvah, whether it's the anipi, 
the spirit hut, the lacrosse game. Most traditions on earth understand the spiritual power and awakening of the adolescent. Now, we have that if we deliberately foster spirituality in the second decade. But left willy-nilly, they go shopping. And there's a lot to pick from. Right? And not all of it is bright, and not all of it is integrated into a practice that can get you back there. And some of the wrong places that they can look are in the transcendent fake back door of substances. It's in the we of driving too fast, woo, right? Way too fast. It's in danger. And the questions of why and the hunger for intergenerational transmission can lead them to bad mentors. So this period of extraordinary opportunity for spiritual growth and development is also the window of greatest risk. The data so profoundly shows an interweaving of spiritual emergence and risk that it is impossible to not view them as two sides of one coin. Nothing in the sciences correlates 0 0.8, 0 0.9 if it's not really two sides of one coin in some way. And in adolescence, we see an 80% protective effect against depression with a strong personal spirituality. We see a 40% protective effect against substance dependence and abuse between a very spiritual kid and an average kid, such that between a very spiritual kid and a kid who doesn't connect, like the red line child, there's an 80%, you could say, protective benefit or increased risk associated with forming a spiritual hub. So this is the most important work we can do for adolescents. It is so important that it should be at the hub of family, if a family feels resonant and on board. We can find a place for it in community activism, in youth organizations. This can be anywhere, because spirituality exists within and without of any specific religious denomination. For many people, religion is the embrace of their spiritual life. And for many people, it is through nature and relationships and other forms of practice that spirituality emerges. Spirituality can find its way as a natural human capacity and endowment along with cognition and emotion into any place we love and care and support youth. Okay, so if it does, and if we support youth, there are long-term benefits which, through the eyes of science, we can chart. Looking at the material level, looking at the structure of the brain, we find in people who establish a strong personal spirituality in adolescence, it is more likely that they will sustain that into college, post-college, young adulthood, and even later adulthood. If they had senior year, upon graduation, a strong personal relationship with the higher power, whatever word that is, God, Allah, the universe. But if someone's senior year says, I have a strong relationship with my higher power, a strong transcendent relationship in whatever tradition that may be, that is sustained over decades. Day in and day out, it affects us. It affects us at the cellular level. It affects us at the level of personality and relationships. It even affects our brain. Everywhere that you see red, there's a thicker cortex in people with a sustained personal spirituality over years. That is a very broad and pervasive region of the brain. The cortex, as you know, is processing power. It's associated with IQ. It thins with Alzheimer's. It is the engine. Okay. When is this set up? Once again, adolescence. So whether or not at 45 I have a thicker cortex has a lot to do with spiritual individuation when I'm 15. The me and not me, the picking through of all that my loving parents and loving community have taught me spiritually against my own inner compass. There's nothing more important we can do for teens than help them to establish a spiritual hub, the spiritual core. And when we do, it unfolds into an entirely different looking life. Two kids can go up on the same block and go to the same school, and the child who's formed a spiritual hub and sees into the world, a sacred world, lives a different life. Here on the left, we have the core tasks of the second decade, identity development, understanding work and relationship. What's my path? This is the life of the spiritual self. 
and this is the life of the performance self, measured by outward success. I'm as good as my past math test, my past football game. Here, I have inherent worth. Whether I say, because I am a soul on earth, because I am made of that from which all is made, because I am created, whatever source or so-called creation myth as a statement of understanding comes from my family. I am set up in the second decade to start to have a spiritual self, which is a performance-based self. Where this really hits kids squarely, well, it's throughout, but is in these two cells. The child who has a core sense of being a soul on earth seeks calling. The gifts and endowments are for a purpose, to serve, to better the world. The child who understands his or herself only on talents and accomplishments lives a much more fragile life. I am no better than my past success, and everything is transient, so pretty soon I'm no better. Okay. What is set up, again, in the second decade sticks with us. So now I'm 45, right? And over here, if, I, if my spouse leaves me, or I lose my standing, or my every last penny, I don't have much, right? But if those same things happen here, I still have everything. The spiritual self is formed in the second decade. Which gives us a view, once again, onto this. A sense of a sacred self and a sacred universe unfolds into a life where things look brighter and I persist. So, ah. <laughs> I mean, we don't have just a bit. How do we help them? How do we help our teens? What are some of the things we can do? Well, one is spiritual practice. Spiritual practice can happen at home. It can happen at the dinner table. It can happen in nature. It can happen in the mosque, church, synagogue. Spiritual practice can happen anywhere. And what is so fascinating is that it appears not to matter where or how it happens. The very same region of the brain that you saw represented in red to be thick in people with a sustained personal spirituality on a Judeo-Christian sample is the very same part of the brain to show cortical thickening in people with a sustained meditation practice outside of the Judeo-Christian tradition. So whether it's prayer or meditation, whether you speak of your relationship with the transcendent in a prayer cognitive format or a oneness understanding or a sense of spirit in and through all living beings, your transcendent relationship, no matter how it's told and how it's represented, seems to have the same neural correlates, which are the thickening of the cortex, the processing power. What is going on? Now here's one of the most interesting findings. There's a side of our lab that looks very much at consciousness. Lord, raise your hand. Lord has been in involved in these discussions for several years and important to these discussions. Meditation, prayer, what is going on? We've looked at multiple levels of analysis at the body, at the cellular level, at the brain. But to step back and take a bigger view, Science also has some rather profound suggestions. The brains I showed you in red, as measured by the MRI, also, also were assessed with an EEG. Right? The very same people who had a sustained spirituality and thickening of the cortex came in and did an EEG, a measurement of the energy on, on their head. And their heads were shown to give off a wavelength, high amplitude alpha. High amplitude alpha has another name. It is Schumann's Sh constant, right? And that is the energy at the Earth's crust. So the spiritually engaged brain is vibrating within the band of nature. We are experiencing oneness because we are indeed part of oneness. Now, how do we help children? How do we help children build out of that practice, whether it's meditation, prayer, spirituality, the translation to identity and work? How do we help children 
integrate into daily life, that felt spiritual experience. And here science also has some answers. The greatest thing as parents that we can do is to be transparent about our own spiritual life. To talk about dark night of the soul, questions emptiness, to pray out loud, to meditate side by side, but to be on a journey together. Because again, it's the interweaving of the parents' love and the sacred love that is the hub of spiritual formation. There are other things we can do too. With a young child, we teach them apple and banana. Couldn't we also teach them a language of spiritual experience? Right? And methods of spiritual knowing. Take seriously their sudden statements about God and their hunger to go to the graveyard or pray or sing with the rabbi. Naming, sharing, and most of all, showing up and meeting them where they are. They've been talking about this all along. And as a culture, we've had cultural earmuffs on because of our lens. When we sat down with hundreds of teens from traditions all over the world, Baha'i kids, Buddhist kids, Latter-day Saint kids, time and time again, the children would say, you know, I think about this all the time, but no one's ever asked me. They'd say, oh, you want to talk about that? They were delighted and surprised that an adult took an interest in these felt spiritual inklings. That is our open door. That is our shot at all of the good things that come because we are meeting them in a child-centered way, as we do here at TC in all forms of pedagogy, meeting them where they are and asking them to help guide us. We are regarding them ultimately as a source. So let's talk. Thanks for coming. Let's talk. Okay. Let's talk. Anyone come with a thought or a question or yeah? Yeah. Oh sure. So in the book I Oh, thank you. Yes. So the question was, I appreciate that, thank you. How spirituality is conceptualized in the book. Spirituality is a broad, broad notion, just like physicality is a broad notion. The book chooses to focus on that dimension, foremost of spirituality, that the science, time and time again, has been shown to be the dimension of spirituality most protective against suffering and foundational but thriving. So while spirituality is a huge notion, we choose to focus, I chose to focus on what the science said of spirituality we know to be helpful for health and thriving. And that piece is the child's own direct relationship with the transcendent. Whether it's prayer or meditation that gets them there or direct knowing, the child's felt sense of relationship to their higher power. And from there opens up all sorts of things, right? From this direct relationship with the higher power comes living in a sacred world and spiritual values and knowing oneself as a sacred self. So much comes from that. But when you look at the data, it's really that personal relationship, the transcendent relationship that's the cornerstone of spiritual life. Other thoughts? And yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, can you speak a bit about, you know, we have this timeline of the adolescent that develops this wonderful spiritual identity. Yeah. And we also have that chart, like, of those who may not really have that. Um, my value comes from what I accomplish. What in your experience or in your research has most often or like facilitated the movement of somebody who's an adolescent in their late teens from that one column, suddenly they realize or something facilitates their trajectory into the other column. Right, that's a great question. So how do I move from a performance self or perhaps feeling disconnected or unaware of spiritual connection to a deep spiritual connection? There are several ways. I'll do three I've heard the most from, from our interviews. The first is suffering time and time again, and in particular, the edges of life. So a relative who they love dearly is ill or someone dies, and it's really the suffering at the edges of life that awakens the deep quest in many teens for what then ultimately is the purpose. And through that, if you are meeting them as a teacher or a parent or a mentor, 
that is your opening to be on the deepest, most firm bedrock possible, which is they're asking that in the ultimate sense. They're on spiritual quest. So that's one way. Another is simply spontaneously because of this emergence. Suddenly they'll ask things that, that you know, I, I didn't used to think about this, but suddenly I find myself wondering, does God exist? And I didn't used to want to do this, but suddenly I find myself wanting to try to see what it would be like to meditate. So there is a spontaneous awakening for many teens. Then another is ritual that involves other youth. So kids who go to prayer-based camps or kids who go on nature hikes. We were out in Utah speaking to some adolescents, and she had been through a very difficult time of pain and struggle. And it was with her loving mentors, who in her case were teachers, on a hike in a national park in Utah that she saw the glistening on the water, which nine times out of ten is part of spiritual awakening for teens. It's very intense. She saw light on the water, and suddenly it all fell into place for her. That story is archetypal. That's a real story. And I heard, so there are many paths, but there are these core archetypal paths. And they do shift, and they stay shifted. But the team needs support to build that spiritual experience into a platform of daily lived spiritual values and mission and sense of self, and you know, a roadmap, a spiritual roadmap. We often find when we speak with adults that many people have had profound spiritual experiences and they've tucked it into a drawer. And they know it's special, but it's put away. And it could be opened up to lead to a different life, perhaps of more f fulfillment and optimal living. Yeah, other questions? Anything over here? The side of the room? Of us? Yeah. My profound spiritual experiences with my children, uh -huh. my teenagers, uh -huh. they're much more interested in each other than uh -huh. they are in me. And I wonder if there's a way to use their relationships with their siblings, and they really just ignore me for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a bit, the other on their own, but yeah. when I have the three together, it's... Okay, so great question. Here's, here's, you'll love this. This is okay. such a relief. Wait till you hear this data. So when we talk with teens, we found that these deep quiet circles just amongst their siblings or peers is where the deep soul searching would happen, the integrated integration of spiritual questions with the heart and, and exploration of ultimate meaning. You know, the, the metaphor is in someone's basement or den, they would talk, or in a quiet corner school. But when we looked at the data, what we actually found was that the people in that room who they'd selected to dig into life's biggest question were nearly identical when it came to spirituality with their parents. So all this work you did in the first 15 years set their register for their very cloistered, very independent, very peer-driven inquiry in adolescence. So you're there. <laughs> well, someone who wants, the, where you've gone, in, if, if you prayed at home, if you thought, talked about God, if you meditated, if you said, I sometimes feel the sunset, is nature showing? You know, if you, how you talk about the world in a deep spiritual way opens their register of experience and paves a road in that they will return to. And they will return to it in an age-appropriate way, which may well be in a hidden corner with other peers. <laughs> but you did a lot of work to help them get there. Um, yeah, and that said, I, I, I can't help but wonder if you were to share something of deep deep personal value if they might just be riveted and remember it forever. Yeah. Since uh, our kids spend two-thirds of their waking time at school, mm. how can we take this message to the schools? Great question. So I just returned from a meeting of 200 school heads in Chicago, and many of these schools are doing faculty reads. And the um, Teachers College will, November 9th, host a large meeting of educators, teachers, school heads, to explore how the core experience of spirituality, including most of these people are from non-denominational or secular schools, can be brought in to their school in their own terms, in their own way. The reason we designed the conference where we asked them to come share their thoughts was because this is not something that's going to change in a top-down way. If we want spirituality to be alive and integrated, it'll be because people in their own heart, on their own terms, with their own language and mission statement, see its possibility. 
So we're asking teachers, we're inviting teachers and educators to explore and then come share what they've discovered. So that's how we're going about it, an iterated bottom-up way. Yeah. Um, it seems that if both parents are so spiritual or interested or curious, mm -hmm. it can be easier to communicate with the student and with the child. But what if one parent is emerging or exploring, mm -hmm. the other parent is super cynical? How does, mm -hmm. Have you ever experienced that? Okay, could you hear, what if, what if there's not a match between parents? And there's many ways that there's not a match between parents, right? Um, the most important thing, I'll tell in an, another metaphor, we very often will meet children who have one parent of one faith tradition and one parent of another faith tradition. And there's two ways that that unfolds. One is that everyone talks about, in their own voice, their spiritual path. You know, in my tradition of Judaism, I often felt that God was present when all the generations were at the Passover table. And my spouse says, you know, as a devout Catholic, for me it's really in Mass. That I, and, and so everyone speaks in the first person. And when everyone speaks in the first person, the child knows that the spiritual life is real. And that we each find, as the picture of the second decade, our way to the direct transcendent relationship. That is... Wonderful. People don't need to match to be spiritually alive and have the child engaged and working. The other thing we sometimes hear is that my mom is an X and my dad is a Y, and so it's all confusing and we don't talk about it. And, and that you know, is really part of a larger social discussion that when it's uncomfortable to talk about, we can kind of back off. But knowing that the science says spirituality is a natural human capacity, it's like not talking about eyesight and not getting your kid glasses. You know, it, I think will help parents feel encouraged that the discussion is worth having and maybe start to explore on their own, their own first person experience of spiritual life. Other thoughts? Yeah. I'm curious about the connection you were making between the importance of not just connecting with the mother, but connecting with other, it's not, I mean, you said adults. Um, and is that directly connected to this spiritual life, or is that separate, or? No? It's a lovely question, thank you. So the child has a natural spiritual compass. There is a process that we've seen in science of selective spiritual socialization, where amongst the adults, neat, 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 the child locks on to the adult with the healthiest, fullest spiritual life. And where we see this most saliently is in children of opiate addicts. The child ends up being concordant spiritually with the other healthy adult whether that's a grandparent or the mom's partner. But the child is a knower. The child is not a blank slate. The 30% that's heritable, the child is a powerful knower and resets the whole family. So that child will seek, if possible, in any way, shape, or form, a healthy, spiritual, essentially loving relationship through which this all forms. Now, there can be no one else in the house, but if I take my child to a spiritually enriched place, a church community, a service group, and some forms of some schools, a place where there can be an adult, I could be absolutely wiped out with clinical depression. I could be in and out of losing child rights for my child. But if there's a regular, loving, committed adult who's spiritually connected, my child has a wonderful chance of spiritual growth. And we saw that because children of opiate addicts who had connected with a spiritual adult other than the opiate addicted mom had rates of spirituality consistent with national averages. They were normal spiritually. Their moms were opiate addicts. Their mothers only had 4% rate of spirituality. Yeah, it's a great question. So if I just can't deal and I'm out of it, just take my kid where there's a spiritually rich environment. Did you have a question? You came from Texas, right? Yes. Well, then you, you came the finest. I, I, was, I didn't have a question, but I want to know when you first knew your own spirituality. Oh, thank you for asking. Um, I think we all have it available to us, always. Um, I am clear that as a child, it was clear to me that that was real, and those were sort of the axioms of the way the world worked. So I guess it's always been that way. With with a cap pulled over my eyes somewhere in college, um, which I write about in the book, the normative process of developmental depression that hits over two-thirds of late adolescents and emerging adults. Yeah. Um, you talked about adversity being sort of an indicator of 
kids for you yeah. know, spiritual awakening. Right. I'm just, I guess I'm wondering about the flip side when, a, especially if a child with pre-existing religiosity encounters mm -hmm. great suffering and has a sort of Nietzsche, God is dead moment that can mm -hmm. strip them of that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that can, thank you, and that can be part of spiritual individuation, right? That the playbook that I got said that life unfolded this way, and it doesn't. And that can launch that me and not me testing of my spiritual direct experience against my philosophy theology roadmap of the world. Um, and it, there's actually another point embedded there that I'd like to raise, which is this living relationship, this transcendent relationship, is the source for children of, of spiritual life and awakening. Um, we found in the data time and time again that if I give my child a very rigid, closed book without that relationship filling it, the, when the closed book, when the rigid book doesn't hold, the child doesn't have anywhere to go. And where we saw that most was in substance abuse and unprotected sex. That kids who got a real rigid message and then no inner spiritual compass with it, you know, were fine until they crossed that one line and then there wasn't help. So there's room for all forms of religion, absolutely, but the active ingredient is the child's own spiritual life inside of that. Where virtuous humanism fits in. Oh, yes. Do you view that as a, another form of spirituality or as something different? And you said it was a high quality and positive attitude. Thank you. And I, I'm happy to answer that, but do you have a thought? I feel like you've been no. thinking about this. <laughs> really? Okay. I, I bet you do. Um, <laughs> okay. So. The measures of spirituality that have been developed over the past 15 years oftentimes engage the notion of the, of the sacred, the transcendent, in and through. Okay. But there are people, about 15%, and if you look when they're older, it's more like 20%, who do not experience that strongly. Now, we would expect that. First of all, we would expect that because as all its distributions, a heritable trait, like the transcendent relationship, would have a distribution, right? The other reason we'd expect that is that most good things, um, which we're talking about now, as well as bad things, which we're not talking about now, most good things have multiple paths, right? So the virtuous humanist we see is absolutely getting to values of virtue and character strengths of outward initiative and capacity. Okay. When we talk to people, what we often hear is that they don't relate to the spiritual stuff. They'll say, I'm not spiritual. This minority group, right? Very virtuous. Some of them their whole lives about service. Um, they'll say, for me, it is in my relationship to other human beings. And it is very specifically in their, the space between people that is meaningful and purposeful. Whether it's commitment to family, whether it's a life of service, but it is, that's what we hear most of all. And science hasn't gotten there yet but there's plenty more to be done. Um, we know that for the 85% for whom the spiritual life is foundational, science hadn't gotten there at all 15 years ago, and we built a lot quickly, which is in the book. So we're on a roll. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Lisa, for those of us who don't have adolescents yet, uh, but you know, sort of at 10 and under, mm. what might we do, or what has your research shown in terms of preparing children for right. that crucial period. That's beautiful, the word prepare. So there's two things. One is in the first decade, we can give them the tools and language of spiritual life. We can give them a practice of connecting to the transcendent so it's there for them. We can give them the notions of connecting head and heart so that when it's amped up with adolescence, they remember, I'm, I have a question of my head, can I answer it with my heart? As opposed to spinning with my head as I move from philosophy to theology to depression. Right? So that those are tools we can give them. But the other thing we can do, and the book talks a lot about the important first decade can be a setup. It's never too late. We can always get in there. But if my, my tween is 10 or 11, I can let them know how magnificent this is about to happen. This may happen to you. You might start wondering about the big questions. You might start feeling the sense of connection. I am, if it does, I'd be so interested if you want to talk about it. Because they think we're not interested. They think that the most extraordinary thing that they're starting to notice spontaneously, 
they're not even sure if it exists because we don't talk about it. So our regard and attention and honoring of spiritual awakening is the bedrock in which they can do a lot of the growth. So it depends how it's taught. Right? I mean, does it allow for the me and not me, the question of the heart, digging in? You know? So in the book, there's two beautiful cases at the end. And one of them is of a young man who was addicted to pornography for a decade. And all the while, this man, who we call Kurt in the book, was the golden boy of his very religious community. He was you know, the school president, and he was, had a position of meaning and honor in his religious community. All the while that he was so admired outwardly, he felt unworthy. He felt outside the radiant light of God. He felt like he was a bad person, unworthy. And there was a horrible split for him. Because he felt that he had lied to others, lied to God. He was an imposter. His healing had to do with unifying his spiritual heart with his natural sexuality. And he said, all I wanted when I was a teen was for someone to tell me, or even just ask me the question, what does your spiritual heart say about your sexuality? All I wanted was for someone to help me bring them together. But instead, they were split. And there was the round and round addiction. And then there was the public good boy behavior. And that split inside of him was intolerable. He, he was an addict. So we can prevent that by forming a spiritual hub that engages all forms of human development, sexuality, identity, everything. Great. So every culture and every person will have their own language of spirituality. And what we do here is we welcome all voices and language when used in the first person. So in one group, discussion of spirituality, one person will be talking about how her grandma tattooed her as a child, and then one person will be talking about Jesus, and one person will be talking about nature, and everyone knows what each other's talking about because it's told in the first person, and because there is the emergence of what I hope our schools can have, which is true multilingualism around spiritual life. We have multilingualism on many important topics, but we don't have it around spiritual life, by which is meant not just that you know the Hindus do it this way and the Jews do it this way, but can you locate in your inner heart, can you locate in your own felt spiritual experience the renewal of spring in the language of four different religions? Can you locate the transcendence around death in four different religions? And by being truly multilingual, it means that we will understand each other in the deepest way. And I think that comes by speaking openly and with interest in the first person with an eye towards knowing in the heart what's being explored. And kids can be taught that. You know, they'll have little ceremonies, but they won't always be asked and can be asked. As we now celebrate redemption, as we now celebrate birth, can you remember a time you felt this way? Did anyone have a little sibling born? Did it seem amazing? You know, the child can learn that along with everything else and never touch one denomination versus another in a secular school. And in fact, I think it's part of multiculturalism. It's absent, and we pay it a big price. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, as a parent, so very often children will spontaneously do things, and if we have the lens of spiritual life in development, it comes forward more clearly. So, for instance, um, think about the family dog or cat. That love is a real love, right? Think about the child's hunger to sing or spontaneously want to try out different forms of prayer. There's a lovely section in the book where a little child sits down who's never done Sufi prayer, which involves movement and swaying, and just naturally wants to try, sits down, and moves into the practice with such delight of her own initiative. So the, the child is, is active and seeking. It comes from within. I think by 
having our lens of spiritual development, we can show up there and see it for what it is. So for, here's a little example. There's a lot of as if that goes on with kids. You know, they want to feed the geese, or they come and birds come around them. And we take away the possibility that the birds are interested in them. We take away the possibility that that's an authentic relationship. And we say, oh, they're hungry. They want you to feed them. Now, they may be, but we also, we, we eradicate, you know, oh, that's such a lovely story. Um, it's as if, you know, we take pretend out of the realm of possibility, and it distances them. Another area is empathy. You know, children often truly feel the pain of another. And while it is important to say, yes, it is that person who was in the car accident, it was that person who's suffering, it is important at the same time to allow them to sustain the felt oneness. You know, we are both one and we are separate. That's our condition. We're both one and separate. We teach them a lot of separate when it comes to empathy. But that, they, that is a real oneness empathy, a unit of empathy. They're born with that. They wail. Babies wail. When one baby wails, other babies wail. It's probably not because they want to be fed, right? They feel that suffering. Yeah. When my son came home from an orphanage, I, I noticed when I visited the orphanage that all the babies, these wonderful women, put the babies in a circle. And the little babies on their tummies would help out each other. If one baby cried, they'd hand them a little toy. And there was a sense of, you know, under 10 months relationship and care. So my son comes home. Um, we gave him the name Isaiah. I take Isaiah to the suburban beach. He has the one thing in the whole world that he loves, which is a cottage cheese container. And <laughs> generously given by his mother. <laughs> and we're at the suburban beach, and someone sees it. And he goes like this. He doesn't think twice. He hands it to the child. You know, and the child plays with it and drops it. And then Isaiah picks it up again and is excited about his cottage cheese container. And this time the child looks at it and the child rips it out of his hand. He was worn. He didn't look sad. He looked flabbergasted. He had never seen mine. Right. So that mine, that notion, it was shocking to him. So this, this generous, empathic, oneness self can be sustained all the way into our adulthood alongside the fact that we also are simultaneously separate and sociobiological and all that. But we're both. And, and I think we lose the oneness too quickly. Mine. I mean, Mom's like, yes, that's yours. Well, <laughs> they're really teaching separateness and lack of unit of awareness. Other questions? Yeah. How do, because the assumption is that we are spiritually awake. And part, you know, we're here because we are interested in it. But how do we learn from the children at the same time as open, become much more aware spiritually ourselves so that we can hear what you hear so clearly? Um, That's such children. a beautiful and point. And people around it's, us. The child is the source, mm -hmm. right? The child comes and it's, a, the child is a porthole. For everyone, the field opens up of love. And people, for instance, at the checkout counter who never liked me are thrilled when I show up with a baby. Right? <laughs> There's this joyful replenishing reset that happens in our culture, in our community, and even in the family. So the child is a source. The knowing child, the spiritual child is a source. And just like tuning forks, we wake up. We wake up with the questions they ask, and we wake up with the things they do. You know, they'll look joyfully at someone who no one else in the family wants anything to do with. You know, the UPS man comes, and they say, man! And you know what? They're right. It is glorious. There is a man. Life created a man. But we didn't see him, and you did. Man! The child is a source. The child's spiritually aware and wakes us all up. So I, I'm so grateful you brought that in. And that's central to the spiritual child. The child is a source of spirit for the family. Should we do one more question, and then we'll have fruit and cocktails? Yeah. <laughs> Say the child, I have this kind of an education and home question. I'm an educator. Say the child, there is, um, you spoke of like, the full time dualism and spirituality mm -hmm. And say that does exist in a school, and for example, I, the teacher, say what my experience is at the school in the context of like this multilingualism. And then the child goes home and 
um, kind of shares that and, and, and shares maybe my experience or totally gets my experience, right? It's true for them too or they understand and, and you connect. But then the child goes home to like a mentor, someone that they've already kind of connected with spiritually in their family, maybe it's a parent or any kind of other transitional figure like that you speak of. And they talk about kind of like this truth or something that was true for them at school. But it's not for the mentor. And the mentor openly kind of says, because something that is different for them spiritually, but there may not. So then, so then what potentially happens is there's kind of like this split. The child feels like, well, maybe what was true for me in that moment, it's not true now. Okay. Because the way they connected to that mentor. What do you say to that? So there's so many rich points. Okay, there's so many rich points. Let me try to pull out a few that I think are, they're all important, but a few that I want to highlight. One, um, the mentor is the carrier of the message, right? So a loving mentor is the infusion of spiritual life along with the message and practice. It's that intertwining of the mentor's love or ways with the spiritual message and spiritual experience. That can swing both ways, right? There's enormous damage done when the messenger undercuts the message of spiritual life, and we know how damaging that is, right? So we have people say that I was disavowed for being who I am because of my X, Y, or Z, and it cut me off from God. When I left from my bad mentors, my house of worship, I threw the baby out with the bathwater. The mentor has an enormous impact, and when it goes well, the mentor is in fact a taste, an ambassador of the sacred presence. Right? That's extremely important. Um, another point that I, I hear embedded in there is that spiritual life is universal, told in the many languages and practices. And a child can be helped and encouraged to know there is a universal spirituality core to our endowment that the Joneses talk about this way, and the Brahmoses talk about this way, and the Lees talk about this way. And this, you know, in our heart is this core felt love, this ebullience. Describe it in whatever words work in your family. Um, that allows them to go anywhere and hear any message and still return to their own heart because you've authorized them as a spiritual knower. And it didn't come from out there. At the end of the day, it came from in here. Other, one more question? Okay. Then thank you for coming. It was really fun. Thanks. Thank you all for being here to celebrate this wonderful um, achievement and beautiful words that you shared. And you, I think all took a little bit beautiful stories that you shared with us as you always do. Um, Lisa will be signing books here if you've purchased one. We still have a few more for sale if you'd like, but there's still plenty of bubbly to continue the celebration. So please enjoy and thank you very much thank again for, for coming. being here.